All for me grog, me jolly jolly grog. All for me beer and tobacco. Well, I spent all me tin with the ladies drinking gin. Now across the western ocean I must wander. Where are me crew, me, crew. me jolly jolly crew? They're all gone for beer and tobacco. Since the COVID came around and the pubs all day shut down, now I'm missing singing songs with you together. They're all with all for me grog, me jolly jolly grog. All for me beer and tobacco. Well, I spent all me tin with the ladies drinking gin. Now across the western ocean I must wander. Yes, across the western ocean I must wander. Thank you, Jack. Um, I really enjoy hearing that song, especially the reference to COVID today. It's sort of a fun mix of historic uh, song with um, current events. So that was very um, wonderful. I understand it was from the Portermen and hopefully we'll hear more about them later this evening. But first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Joan Whitlow and I am the Executive Director at the Customs House Maritime Museum. Before we begin, I just wanna remind everybody that is participating on Zoom. Those are, these are the members of the Customs House that your microphones will be muted and video off during the presentation. You're welcome to type comments or questions into the chat box, but at the end, we will invite everyone to turn on their video and microphone. It may be helpful to hide the non-video participants and just use your speaker view with this evening's um, presentation. Tonight, we have a special program in connection with the Early American Tavern exhibit, just one of the many programs we had envisioned but had, had to adapt. Entertainment for Man and Horse, curated by Sean Palmetier, highlights the New England taverns. Taverns, also known as public houses, inns, or ordinaries, were places for travelers and locals, people to gather, rest, eat and drink, listen to music such as the Porterman, and to play games. In the late 17th century, taverns also served as a courthouse for the traveling circuit judge. The Customs House Maritime Museum exhibit items that have been found or associated um, with New England taverns, such as copies of tavern licenses, gaming and smoking implements, and of course, a large sampling of tavern signs. We even have an architectural section of a wall or fiddler's throne from the Mac Tavern in Deerfield, New Hampshire. The exhibit also features items loaned from historic New England, Old Sturbridge Village, and from Hollis Broderick. Come see the American, the Early American Tavern Exhibit weekends when we are open to the public. That's Saturday, 10 to 4, and Sundays, 12 to 4. A special thanks to the um, sponsors for this exhibition. Um, a shout out to the Newburyport Bank, the Kennard Bullen Charitable Trust, the Felicia Fund Incorporated, and of course, the Tettleman Foundation. Tonight, we are happy to host Tales and Ales, an event typically held inside Newberry, Newberry's um, Sweat Ilsley House. You may have traveled past this large white clapboard house on Route 1A, just as many have for the last 350 years. The Ipswich Ale Brewery, Brewery has crafted and donated cask of ale for this program since 2009. And in keeping with the tradition, they have donated the Winter Knock, um, for the readers of this evening's program. So thank you very much for doing that. Bethany Groff Duro is a historic New England regional um, site manager. She's responsible for 12 properties in Essex County. She's based at the Spencer Pierce Little House, I'm sorry, Spencer Pierce Little Farm um, in Newberry, and tonight will present Tales and Ales. Bethany is the author of numerous books on local history, including A Brief History of Old Newberry, and is a recipient of many awards, including the Preservation Leadership Award for the Newberry Preservation Trust. Bethany serves as a board for lo several local organizations, such as Lowe's Boat Shop and the Planning Committee of the Newberry Port Literary Festival. She has published articles in the New York Times, 
the New England Quarterly, the Encyclopedia of American History, and Historic New England Magazine. She holds an MA in history from the University of Massachusetts and lives in Newburyport. I'm sorry, I keep saying Newburyport because that's where I work. Lives in West Newberry um, with her family. Visit Bethany's website to purchase books and read her blog at bethanygroffdoreau.com. So let's imagine sitting in Newberry's Sweat Aylesley House, just one of the three watering holes in 17th century Newberry, also known as Sweat Tavern. Let us all hear some tales and drink some ale. Go ahead. Leave it to Jack to, you know, make my entrance grand. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I have been so, oops, can you all see and hear me? Okay, sorry, my computer just gave me a funny little um, message. Uh, okay, thank you for the thumbs up. So I will say, first of all, thank you, Susan, for giving me a thumbs up. The thing that this program is missing of course, is actual human interaction. So I encourage you, you know, through emojis or, you know, whatever you, whatever you have, give me a little feedback as we go. Um, this is one of my favorite events of the year. We generally do this in the spring and in the mm -hmm. fall um, at the Sweat Ilsley House, which is an empty building. It's an incredible architectural, uh, you know, site uh, and a museum that's open for tours, but it comes alive as a tavern at night. So. I miss that. You can see a little bit of a, you can see a, a spread from a former Tales and Ales here behind me. It's really wonderful. So I encourage you all, this is going to be fun, but it's no substitute for being in the Sweat Ilsley House. Um, and I want to thank the Maritime Museum for the Custom House for having me. Uh, again, I've been here several times before and it's one of my favorite things um, to come talk to you folks. And I am uh, in particular just impressed with how much work has gone into putting these together virtually. So um, all of you, Jack, Joan, and everyone who has agreed to uh, be my, my puppets here tonight, I just wanted to uh, thank you all for participating. All right, so let's get this party started. And I start every party by introducing my husband. James, are you here? Can you unmute and can you be seen here on the screen? I believe I can be seen right now. <clears throat> Fantastic. <Greetings. laughs> So I'm gonna introduce James, who is not only my husband, but he is my deputy for this evening. Um, he will be assisting me in calling the court, calling the accused. Um, but he is, of course, also the operations manager of Ipswich Ale. So I've invited him to say a few words about what we will be, I hope you are all drinking this evening. <laughs> James, how's it going upstairs? Yeah, it's, it's just great to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Good to see you again, Bethany. Uh, greetings, everybody. Hope I'm coming in loud and clear. I am having the Winter Noct is one of uh, the, the beers we thought we'd have tonight. Um, let's see, the brewery's been around since 91. So this is our 30th anniversary this year. So we're kicking it off in grand style. Hopefully we can uh, celebrate it at some point later this year with others in person. So anyway, that being said, uh, we started this back in 2009. Uh, I met Bethany through uh, Historic New England, uh, doing some uh, uh, donations to Historic New England. And uh, we were chatting one day, she was telling me about the court records and uh, how they were done in taverns. And uh, I thought tavern night. So we both agreed that tavern night would be a great idea. And uh, from there on, it's, you can't have a tavern night without a good ale. So that's what I did. I, I started producing uh, cask ales, which are, which is beer that it, it's, it's does goes through a secondary fermentation inside the cask. So it's a, it's a living product. Uh, the carbonation forms naturally. And that's how it uh, is often drunk, uh, especially at that time period and, and especially later. Um, uh, we decided on winter knocked it being winter. It's a good, it's called a German style Schwarz beer, which comes back from the uh, 1300s. 
Uh, it was probably an ale back then before it was like uh, slowly evolved into a, a lager, but nobody knew what yeast was back then. So um, uh, beer was uh, the pale ale is usually what we think of when we think of English ales. Uh, pale ale didn't come around pale malt till the early 1700s and not readily available till the late 1700s, 1780s and later because it was an expensive process using coke fired kilns to kiln the malt instead of wood. So I think uh, a beer back in the 1670s would have been probably dark and would have been a little bit smoky from the, the wood for drying the malt. So uh, I thought, well, Winter Knocked, I think is going to be just fine right there. So there we are. Uh, it's been fun working with uh, Historic New England. And we just uh, just have a, a, a great relationship with them. And I also formed a relationship with Bethany and married her. So here I am. <laughs> Thank you, James. Certainly. He's great, everybody. Oh, you don't have to answer that. As long as I think he's great, we're good. <laughs> All right, well, let's, uh, let's get started on our program. Um, so as James said, we've been doing Tales and Ales for 12 years. Uh, the first one was in 2009, and it came out of this conversation we were having actually during a vintage baseball game. I know some of you are vintage baseball fans and miss those events. Um, but we had a, uh, our professional relationship turned into a personal relationship, and we were married actually at the Rocky Hill Meeting House in 2014. So I have Tales and Ales to thank for my my wonderful husband and tonight's deputy. So thank you, James, stay at the alert. I'm gonna call you soon. So uh, I was incredibly impressed with, with the tavern exhibit, sorry, puppy, um, that, that, was, that took place at the custom house. Um, and hold on one second. James, can you deal with him please? <laughs> it's just the perfect time for somebody to drive up the driveway, isn't it? Our dog is having a fit. Um, so uh, as I was saying, I, I, the tavern exhibit was incredibly uh, interesting. I thought it was incredible, it was very, very well done. And it made me think a lot about early taverns in early Newbury, uh, which is something that I talk about during Tales and Nails, of course. So uh, the building of a tavern was incredibly important to the first settlers of Newbury. And that is just something to keep in mind. The tavern was not just a place where you went to drink, it was a place where you went for every social purpose other than sort of strict town governance business or religious business. So anything else that happened in the community, it's a place where you went to get messages, um, a place where you picked up your mail, a place where you had any sort of communication, a place where you stayed if you were, if you were passing through the town. Newbury was first settled in May, 1635. In, by September, they had been granted their first license to keep an ordinary. And there's actually a marker to this first ordinary that's down on the lower green. That was granted to Francis Plummer. And in the court record, it says, Francis Plummer, who came to Newbury soon after the incorporation of the town was licensed to keep an ordinary. Two years later in June, 1637, John Knight, also of Newbury was granted liberty, quote, to keep an ordinary and give entertainment to such as need. Don't we all occasionally need entertainment? On May 22nd, 1639, Edmund Greenleaf of Newbury was permitted to keep a house of entertainment as well. So uh, entertainment was not sort of a you know burlesque. A house of entertainment was simply a place where you could gather. It was a tavern. It's another word for a tavern. Um, but before Newbury was settled at all, the general court, which was in Boston, had exerted its authority and declared that no person whatsoever should keep a common victualling house without license from the court, who also controlled the price of goods, food, and drink that could be sold at a tavern. By 1639, however, such was the crush of new settlers and visitors that the general court relaxed this restriction. They said, and they are a wordy, a wordy bunch, and I will use original uh, records wherever I can, so you're gonna be hearing some words. They said, in regard to the, of the great inconvenience that is found for want of fit places of entertainment of people upon occasion of great assemblies and the arrivals of ships with passengers, it is declared that upon such occasions, it is lawful for any person in any town where such great resort of people happen to be to give entertainment to such people and afford them lodging and diet at reasonable rates 
though they not be allowed to keep common ordinaries, et cetera. Meaning by 1639, so many people were arriving in Essex County and in Newbury that anyone could throw open their doors and basically start an Airbnb um, and charge for it, although they were not allowed to be a permanent tavern. So by 1645, the court was eager to reassert control over taverns once again. Part of this is that the uh, influx of settlers had, had calmed down considerably because of the English Civil War, and partly because the general court was eager to assert authority over everything because that meant money, that meant taxes and licenses and money. Uh, they referred the matter to the quarterly courts. So we'll talk a little bit more about the quarterly courts later on. But from then on, when a Newbury family wished to open a tavern, uh, they took their petition to Ipswich instead of to Boston. Uh, and it was to this court in Ipswich that Dionys Stevens Coffin, the mother of the man who built the Coffin House, which many of you uh, have visited, it's another one of historic New England's museums, was brought in September 1643 to be prosecuted for selling beer for three pence per quart, while the established price was two pence per quart. Uh, so Diana Stevens Coffin came into court. She is the brewer. Women were generally the brewers. It was uh, a sort of cooking um, that was generally done by women. In fact, women often brewed a beer uh, called a bride ale before they married to prove that they could brew beer um, and good beer. So women were often married on the merits of their beer. It certainly is why I married my husband. So Diana Stevens Coffin came to the Essex County Quarterly Court. She was fined for charging too much for her beer. And she said, essentially, I deserve to charge more for my beer because I use better ingredients. I use more malt in the hogshead. In other words, it's stronger beer and it's better quality. And so I deserve to charge more. And the court allowed it. So uh, James informed me that in craft brewing circles, Diana Stevens Coffin is considered the mother of craft beer. Make better beer and charge more for it. So. There you go. She's also my ninth great grandmother. So there's a good, good brewing history here in this family. So the general, the uh, quarterly court discharged her. But let me tell you what in the blue blazes is the Essex County Quarterly Court. And I will tell you that it is, in my opinion, the most amazing record in the world. It has everything romance, murder, witchcraft, tons and tons of violence. And best of all, lots of sex as well. Best of all, the witness statements that were taken in the Essex County Quarterly Court were taken down in person, verbatim, first by the clerk of the court, so you had to physically come into the court, uh, and then after 1650 by a magistrate who you gave your statement to, and then you had to take the statement to court and just swear that this was your statement. And all of these statements appear in the record. And this is magical to a historian of this period because so many of the people that lived in these communities, many of them were literate in that they could read, um, fewer of them were literate in that they could write, uh, and many fewer were too busy trying not to starve to death and have 10 kids, and so were not sitting around writing down their thoughts or making careful notes of the slang they use in conversation with their friends every day. And so because of that, we have very few first person voices from the history of a place like Newbury outside of the Essex County Quarterly Court. So you could look at that and you could say, well, court records are not necessarily reflective of everyday life because they are uh, records of people that somehow had a run in with the law. And that would be true today, maybe. Um, but in the 17th century, everyone went to court for something. So there are women well represented here. There are Native Americans represented here. There are children, there are enslaved people, there are servants and their, their voices are written down often, not only verbatim, but phonetically. So you hear, and you're gonna hear some of these voices tonight. And that to me is as close to conjuring, you know, a spirit as you can get is to really hear someone's voice that hasn't had one in hundreds of years. So we're going to we're going to play with that a little bit. That was the genesis of Tales and Ales was to have people have these wonderful for me wonderful. I hope you enjoy them, but insights into the way that people lived, the way they talked, the the slang they used, wonderful. So the Essex County Quarterly Court was just what it sounds like. It was a court that took place quarterly in Essex County. Um, 
originally the general court in Boston wanted to control all licensing, all trade. But then of course, settlement was so out of control that they established quarterly courts um, that ran, uh, these began in 1635, the first uh, Ipswich quarterly court, sorry, Essex County quarterly court. So they went back and forth between Ipswich and Salem. So there would be a Salem court and then the next court would be Ipswich. And you went to the quarterly court that you lived closest to. Um, so the first session was held in Salem in 1636. And then um, it was held thereafter in Ipswich. The first recorded session is in 1641. Um, there are a couple of other little differences um, when you're reading the record as I do. One is that the calendar was different. Um, the year started prior to the 18th century, the year actually started on March 1st. So if you say the seventh month, you have to count from March instead of from January. Um, also, Essex County did not include Salisbury um, and Haverhill. Initially, they were part of a county called Norfolk County, which included what is now um, parts of New Hampshire, it included ha Hampton, Exeter, Portsmouth, and Dover. Um, and then in 1680, when those other towns became New Hampshire, then Salisbury and Haverhill and then Amesbury um, were represented in, the, in Essex County. They came into Essex County. Other than that, it's the same towns. And luckily for us, luckily for me, in 1911, a gentleman named George Dow transcribed the Essex County Quarterly Courts, um, court records, and uh, he included Salisbury and Haverhill in his accounting because they are part of the modern Essex County. So you can read all of these records online tonight if you want to have a good laugh. Uh, just Google Essex County Quarterly Courts George Dow and just, it's, they're just wonderful. I, I spend hours with them. They crack me up. The Essex County Quarterly Court dissolved in 1692 with the establishment of the Court of General Sessions of the Peace for criminal cases and the Court of Common Pleas for civil cases. So before 1692, from 1636 to 1692, the Essex County Quarterly Court is where you went for everything except for divorce, which was a pretty big deal, um, banishment, meaning you were you know, probably a heretic, uh, or murder. Although many of those cases began in the quarterly courts. You can follow people's lives um, through the courts up to the point where they end up in Boston for one reason or another. So the Essex County Quarterly Court, aside from being a first person record of life in 17th century Essex County, which is beautiful enough, also took place in a tavern. So taverns, as I said, are the buildings where everything happened except religious matters um, and town matters. And so the taverns were also the places where court sessions were held. So um, they were not held ever in Newbury but you would you know, pack up your family if you had to give a witness statement and you would go to Ipswich. And there are records of, you know, of Ipswich being sort of a party town when court was in session um, twice a year where everybody would go and stay and the taverns would be overflowing. There are also records that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that people were drinking during the court sessions as you could imagine they would be. Um, but for the purposes of tonight's mm -hmm. record, uh, I'm going to take you to meet Stephen Sweat. So Stephen Sweat is the gentleman who built the Sweat Ilsley House. The Sweat Ilsley House, which was actually Historic New England's very first uh, museum, was purchased in 1911 by Historic New England, then SPNEA. Um, that was built by Stephen Sweat, um, and it may have been used as a tavern briefly. His earlier building, which was pretty much uh, a little bit down the road where March's Hill is now, um, was purchased before the Sweatelsey House was built um, by Hugh March, after whom March's Hill is named. So let's get back to the hero of today's tale, Stephen Sweat. And uh, Stephen Sweat was presented to the Essex County Quarterly Court in 1653, and the following verdict was read into the record. Deputy, are you available? I am indeed. Stephen Sweat, being presented by the townsmen of Newbury to keep an ordinary, is allowed by this court. Thank you, sir. Sadly for our purposes, as I said, the Sweats Tavern in which today's featured tavern tale took place was likely across the street from the current Sweatelsley House and down the road. Since Stephen Sweat had conveyed a large piece of land to Hugh March in 1670, reserving a small lot for his own use. 
This is borne out by Hugh March's reference in court in 1682 to an ancient tavern on his property. Whatever Sweat's Tavern looked like, I want you to imagine it looked like a, a standard private home, probably two rooms on the first floor, two rooms on the second floor, and a lean-to. It would have had a large smoky fire, even a large, a larger fireplace if it was a purpose-built tavern, a larger fireplace than you would find in your ordinary homes, which are still quite large. A large smoky fire from which coals had been raked and pots set on them. There would have been a little light food available, generally roasted, boiled, or baked in the fireplace. And by 1670, when Sweat's Tavern was built, the current Sweat Elsey House, it was likely that beer, liquor, and wine would all be served here, although beer was by far uh, the most common beverage for people of all ages, men, women, and children. The sale of wine and liquor in taverns was banned in 1637, though the court generally made, generously made allowances for, quote, any such innkeeper or victualler to have in their house some small quantity of strong water for their private and necessary use. So you know that there really was liquor in these taverns. Later, all licenses were purchased and then resold by a town agent. That's for hard alcohol. In 1665, Stephen Sweat renewed his license to keep ordinary, draw wine, and retail liquors. So there were hard liquors available in Stephen Sweat's tavern. So the action in the first case tonight takes place at Sweat's Tavern in June 1664. The case is heard at a tavern in Ipswich used for the seating of the Essex County Quarterly Court. And I'm going to tell you before we move into other court records, um, there are so many records available. And one of the ways that I wanted to sort of demonstrate the richness of these records is that all of the records that are read today are all from the same sitting of the same court in Ipswich in 1664. So this is one sitting of a court that sat and was recorded completely from 1636 until um, 1692. So you can just imagine the wealth of information that's there. So imagine this, the judges are taking testimony from witnesses against a Captain Walter Barefoot and a Dr. Henry Greenland about an event that took place in Sweat's Tavern. I have to give you a little bit of background. Testimony can get fairly complicated and we are reading it in the original language so it can get a little thorny. Captain Barefoot and Dr. Greenland were quite a, quite a pair. They were referred to in court documents as loving friends and they certainly were more than acquaintances. I would say they were accomplices. Greenland had come to Newbury in 1662, so just two years earlier, leaving his wife in England. Almost immediately he became involved with a married woman and the subject of numerous seduction claims and slander suits. Captain Barefoot was a fur trader and a maverick with business relationships and court cases from Boston to Portsmouth. They both carried swords, they dressed as gentlemen, and they liked to drink and fight. On June 6th, 1664, Barefoot and Greenland were drinking in the tavern, they were drinking in Stephen Sweat's tavern, when a native man named Sessa Genoway walked in. Barefoot had sued Sessa Genoway for some furs he felt were owed to him, but the case was unresolved, and when Barefoot saw him at the tavern, he called on his friend Greenland to restrain him and sent for the constable. Barefoot went into a back room and filled out an attachment, which was a document which gave the constable the right to take bodily possession of Sessa Genoway. The most interesting thing about that entire statement is the fact that Sessa Genoway walks into the tavern. He's meeting friends in the tavern. This is at a time when there are numerous laws against serving alcohol to native men. It's not, if you read the official record, you would never know that this was happening. And it was happening, the fact that he was in the tavern was not remarked on as remarkable at any point in this record. So there are all sorts of ways that there's so much more to learn about how people really interacted with each other. Richard Dole, whose descendant, um, nephew, I think, built, a, built the Dole Little House, which is another historic New England property, um, had a servant who had previously testified against Dr. Greenland at an earlier adultery trial. It's a whole other story. And Stephen Sweat, who of course was the owner of the tavern, came into the room where Barefoot was filling out the warrant and questioned his right to seize Sessa Genoway. Henry Greenland then came to his friend's rescue and Sessa Genoway made a hasty exit and then a nasty fight ensued. Constable, will you please read the warrant? Yes, I will. For the arrest of Mr. Greenland and Captain Barefoot for a great misdemeanor against William Thomas and Richard Dole of Newbury, endangering their lives, served by William Chandler Constable. 
you. I also present the constable's bill. One pound, seven shillings for going after them to Salisbury Ferry, bringing barefoot to Ipswich before the worshipful Major General Dennison, myself and two to assist me. He would not come on foot. Therefore, I was constrained to hire four horses. Also, late in the day when I took him, the reason is that he went from me after I told him my business in Newbury. I also spent much time after Mr. Greenland. Thank you, sir. So this is often, this is exactly the way this appears in the Essex County Quarterly Court. And I will also tell you that the constables were paid by court fees. So you can better bet that he's gonna make sure that he tells you exactly what he had to do to get his hands on these guys, but it looks like they did not come easily. So we're gonna find out what happened at Stephen Sweat's Tavern and I'm gonna call William Thomas. I am William Thomas. I being in an inward room, Stephen Sweat's kitchen and seeing Richard Dole abused, went to Mr. Greenland and asked, sir, what do you mean to do? He answered, thou rogue, why art thou come? And struck me down suddenly. I arose again, but he thrust me against the boards of the little room, forcing me into a, si a still, uh, a sill. Then he threw me down, fell upon me, kicked me, tore my leg, stamped upon my stomach, very rashly, until I thrust up my feet and lifted him off. Mr. Greenland took hold of the door and window and stamped upon my face and breast until I was bloody, except my eyes. When he had finished, I saw him take the fore part of my coat, tear it into little pieces, and then he went out of the room and told other men to see how I had been abused. Thank you very much, William Thomas. That was well read. So basically what's happened is that William Thomas goes in because Richard Dole has challenged um, Greenland's right to arrest, basically arrest Cesar Genoa. So he goes into the room and he, and of course he's being beaten up and William Thomas tries to defend him. William Thomas is then beaten up and his description of the wounds that he suffers is just wonderful. And I'll tell you a family favorite is all bloody but my eyes. <laughs> so every once in a while, my husband will come home from a particularly hard day at work and I'll say, how, how was your day? And he will say, I'm all bloody but my eyes. So these things really do creep into your everyday life. Um, okay, thank you so much. Richard Dole, let's hear from you. Uh, I am Richard Dole. I was at the ordinary in the common room when Captain Barefoot, Mr. Greenland, and an Indian were in conversation. And I sat down on a bench the man of the house, Sweat, being with me. I asked Sweat if the Indian had a legal case with Barefoot. Barefoot answered, you had best give security to prosecute. I replied, Captain, I say nothing to you, nor do I meddle or make with you. Presently, he told me, that he would make me the veriest knave in all New England and would have made an example of me earlier had he not been persuaded by some of his friends. I said, Captain, do not threaten me, neither to my face nor behind my back. Mr. Greenland took up Captain Barefoot's words. I said to Greenland, what if I was to say that clerk Barefoot was an ass or a fool to set his name to anything. So any man may write what he pleases. Captain Barefoot, sitting on the other side of the table, said to me, sir, get thee out of the room or I will heave the pot at thy head. Presently, he threw the pot and struck me on the head backwards to the ground. And as soon as ever I had recovered myself, Mr. Greenland, with his hand and foot, struck me down backward and trod upon and kicked me. I being in a mess with the blows, I can't tell whether he did kick or tread on me. 
Somebody, speaking to Captain Barefoot, asked him why he did heave the pot at me, and he made this answer. He was sorry for nothing, but that he did not heave it harder. I do solemnly profess that I go about my business in fear of my life, of Captain Barefoot and Mr. Greenland. Further, that after I got up, Captain Barefoot came from the inside of the table with a sword drawn and with high threatening words, he spoke to those that were in the room. That was beautifully done. Beautiful, Terry, thank you so much. So this is this is quite a quite a piece in so many different ways, and I mean this is like a script for a movie. It's just wonderful. You did a great job. Um, so basically, Richard Dole is goes into the room where Captain Barefoot is writing out this this writ uh, to arrest Sausage anyway, and he's sitting with Stephen Sweat, and he does one of these like sitting across the table, and he says basically, so what anybody can just arrest anybody in this town. That's how this works now, right? And the captain says did you say something to me? And he says, I'm not even talking to you. I don't mess with you. I don't, whatever. <laughs> and Barefoot said, um, you know, I would have beaten you up a long time ago, except my friends told me not to. And then, you know, Richard Dole, and then he says, you know, I'm going to throw a pot at your head. <laughs> and he says, sir, get thee out of the room or I will throw the pot at thy head. And then the next line is, and then he threw the pot at my head. So he knocked Richard Dole out and then he was, you know, he just beat the snot out of him and then came over with his sword drawn, which is a very serious threat. It's basically with your gun drawn and with high threatening words, he told everybody to get out of the room. So get a sense of who these people are very clearly um, based on what they're doing there. But isn't that one, just the detail in that record is so wonderful. I love it so much. All right, I'm gonna call John Davis, who's also in on this whole thing. I am John Davis. I was at Sweat's house on sa Saturday, June 6th. And there was Mr. Thomas, who hearing that Richard Dole was under the power of Mr. Greenland, had come in to his rescue, said Dole out of his hands. Captain Barefoot drew his rapier. I, being on the kitchen side, withdrew to the kitchen away from the rapier and endeavored to rescue Mr. Thomas. Mr. Barefoot came towards me with his naked rapier and ran against me saying that I should not go in, but let them alone for none shall go in. When Mr. Thomas arose, his face was all bloody so that blood ran down on his beard. He complained of his stomach and leg and slipped, slipping down his stocking. His leg was bloody and bruised with skin off. That's horrifying. So now there is actual cutting with swords happening at the Newberry Tavern in 1664. So John Davis is trying to come to the rescue of Richard Dole and, uh, and Captain Barefoot, who is basically defending Greenland or Greenland that is defending, they're, they're defending each other. Um, and then he is, uh, Captain Barefoot comes at him with a sword and cuts him, says his leg was bloody and bruised with the skin off. So this is Mr. Thomas that was attacked in that way. So I also love that he said, I, I went to the kitchen away from the rapier. In other words, I, I just wanted to get out of the way of the sword. It's brilliant. Okay, Benjamin Lowell, I call Benjamin Lowell. I am Benjamin Lowell. Mr. Barefoot came in with his naked sword stood against the door and said he would run any man through who came to the door to help Mr. Thomas. And he drove all out of the room. So here is another point about these court cases. Well read, Mr. Custom House. <laughs> well done. Everybody that was in the tavern has a witness statement. I picked a slight few. And this, you know, goes back to my point that everyone eventually shows up in the court records, because if you were in that tavern, you had something to say and you went to the Ipswich court to say it. So it's just it's brilliant. Um, so Greenland and Barefoot made it as far as the ferry to Salisbury before they were apprehended. And you know how much that cost because we have the constable's bill. It's a wonderful uh, full picture. Barefoot put up a good fight. Um, Captain Barefoot escaped from the constable who found him the next day 
who, and he also of course mentioned that he had difficulty finding Dr. Greenland. Finally, the two had their day in court and were fined five pounds each for the brawl and for resisting arrest. Five pounds is a good deal of money. Greenland was banished from Essex County and settled in Kittery and uh, his cantankerous exploits in Newbury then ended. I will tell you that Captain Barefoot shows up again in Connecticut. He shows up in the court records in Connecticut. So he, he lived a, a long and uh, disruptive life uh, in New England during his time here. I think he, he is the subject. He should be the subject of a wonderful TV show. He certainly got into some trouble. So there were at least three places to buy liquor in Newbury in 1664, not just Stephen Sweat's Tavern. Um, Stephen Sweat's Tavern was in a prime location close to the meeting house, which was then basically uh, in front of the uh, center of the First Parish burying ground. So across the street from the current First Parish Church is where the meeting house was. Um, and of course, you know, what do you do when you're at endless meetings, uh, when you're taking a break from endless meetings at the meeting house, you go to the tavern. So that basically defined downtown. It was a prime location. Uh, there was also Captain Paul White, who had uh, built Newbury's first wharf and was licensed in 1662 to run a distillery and sell, sell strong water by the court. It's also likely that the first tavern run by Tristram and Dionys Coffin was still in business five years after they had left to go settle Nantucket. By 1668, however, it seems that at least one of the taverns had closed down and the selectmen petitioned the court in Salem that Captain White be licensed to sell wine out of doors as well. Uh, wine was considered medicinal and of course was used by the church, but many people were starting to drink more wine by the 1660s and 70s. The court records are filled with drunken brawls, but the court cases that, and court cases range from the, actually from the dull. There's a lot of fights about fence lines, just as there are currently among neighborhoods. Um, but there's some that are just so sublime and wonderfully detailed uh, that I've picked out just a random selection. Another beautiful thing about reconstructing these court cases is that they lay out exactly who was sort of on the docket for the day, both as judges and as the jury. So in September 1664, the judges are Mr. Simon Bradstreet, Mr. Samuel Simmons, Major General Dennison, and Major William Hathorne. So that's the judges sitting on the benches, the juries of trials. So these are ordinary people called to do jury service. They are Ensign Thomas French, uh, somebody Rain Wainwright, I can't read my own typing there. Uh, and it looks like Francis Wainwright, William Fellows, John Dane, Thomas Smith, John Poor, who is my, guess it, I live at the Poor Farm, this is my eighth great grandfather, Sergeant Greenleaf, Edward Richardson, William Acey, Richard Swan, John Brocklebank, and Isaac Cummings. And then the grand jury is also listed here. So you can, even if you just took the jurymen, you know exactly who's sitting in this tavern. And then you get to hear who they were, which cases they were seeing. So one of the, one of my favorites is Anthony Day. Can I call Anthony Day to read his witness statement? I am Anthony Day, aged about 40 years. I heard John Megas threaten Osmond Dutch that if he came into the stage any more to fetch Cod's head more than his own share, he would make his heels fly higher than his head and would throw him over the stage head. Well done, Anthony Day. Thank you for that. <laughs> so this is, again, this is sort of a standalone witness statement. It, it shows up in a form that is very similar to a lot of these records where somebody is testifying not about something that happened to him, but about something that he heard somebody else say. So hearsay is completely admissible in all of these cases. And he says, I heard John Megas threaten Osmond Dutch if he came into the stage anymore to fetch Cod's, Cod's heads. So... You all have probably heard of Stage Fort Park in Gloucester. The stage is where you dry cod. So this is basically a fight over how many cod's heads you're allowed to have, what your share of cod's heads is. But I love that. If you come and take more than your share, I'll make your heels fly higher than your head. So that was just a standard uh, sort of witness statement about an overheard threat. Okay, on a more somber note, I'd like to call Susanna Rogers. I am Susanna Rogers. I being a poor widow, having four children left me, do humbly desire this honored court to consider my condition. My husband died and left me little but a parcel of land upon Plum Island. My poor children were put out to apprentice to pay for this land. 
I am greatly damnified as I am disposed of my habitation. I have been hindered of making use of my meadow, which is about 40 acres for which I have had two shillings an acre. I mowed some of it and it was fetched away, about 10 loads of it. The loss of my grass puts me upon great suffering for want of corn, which I could have had for my grass. Thank you, that was very well read. So this is a very interesting case as well and also illuminates another aspect of the quarterly court. Susanna Rogers, as she mentions, was left a widow. She has four children, her husband has died and left her with a piece of land on Plum Island. So she goes to the court because two other men who owned, who were part of that same purchase of land have, uh, have basically decided to absorb her part of it. Um, you know, they've, they, she does not have the same legal rights in Puritan New England as her husband did, but she does have the rights to that land because she's using it. She's, you know, keeping it for her children. She also points out very poignantly that her children had to be apprenticed in order to pay for this land. And now she's being kicked off it. And then to me, I don't know if any of you have ever paid, even with modern equipment, but it is hot, sweaty, dirty work. Paying is not fun. And this woman was haying her own field on Plum Island in order to sell it to buy corn. This is not corn that we think of corn, it's wheat. So she's selling hay, she's haying this field herself to buy wheat so she can basically make bread and everything else for her family. So her only recourse in this situation where this land is being taken from her is to go to the quarterly court, which acts as a sort of a family court. Um, and actually she won her case and she was uh, given her land back and the men who had tried to swindle her out of it uh, were denied the right to do so. They were um, told that they actually needed to pay her an additional fine as well. So um, Susanna Rogers got her day in court. This is another interesting point to me because women's voices appear in the 17th century even less than men's. Um, they very rarely signed formal documents. They were often sort of uh, assumed under the legal personage of their husbands, although they were active in every possible way um, it just not in ways that tended to make it into the official record. But they went to court and they defended themselves and they defended their children and they defended their land and they hayed a field on Plum Island. So I love her. Hangs hard work, man. I'm with you. All right. Let's talk to William Durkee, one of my favorites. Jerky Durkee, I call him. Where's William? I am William Durkee. <laughs> I wish that I had never spoken as the, oh God, I wish I had never spoken as I had owning the child of Martha Cross to be mine. I would rather keep the child than keep her. But if I keep one, I must keep the other. And I, I have 18 meals a week and I will spare six of them to keep the child. We have agreed to be married tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, Jerky Durkee. You're very young. I'm surprised you could even grow a mustache. You did a wonderful job. So this is a favorite of mine. I, I was very happy. Um, I was very happy to find it that it was in the same court session. So William Durkee obviously had a relationship with Martha Cross. And the backstory is that Martha Cross's father was trying to prevent them from being married, even though Martha Cross was with child by William Durkee. Uh, William Durkee, I believe, was a servant and that is borne out by him saying, I have 18 meals a week, meaning he's probably just an apprentice um, at this point, but he's managed to get her in trouble. So he says, you know what? I'd rather have the child than her because you know, at least the child's mine. <laughs> and But I guess if I'm gonna have one, I'll take them both. And so he says, I'll marry her. And the father says, no, you won't. You know, you're not worthy of her. I don't know what the father's plan was, but the court actually ordered that they were to be married. So the court allowed the marriage and overrode the father and offered to fine him if he stood in the way. So I, I need to do a little research and figure out if that ended well, but that, that's where we find them. I love that. I would rather, if I keep one, I must keep the other. I just love it. Okay. So this was a new one to me. Every time I go back in the record, I find a new wonderful tidbit. And I was introduced to Daniel and Faith Black in this, uh, this last session. They are from Boxford and I'm going to call Daniel Black, who by the way, is in Scotland. I, I mean, he's from Scotland. 
I didn't tell the actor portraying Daniel Black this, so do not expect a Scottish accent, but just keep it in mind. Daniel. Scottish accent, huh? Uh, <clears throat> I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's, all right. That's all right, you threw me. I am Daniel Black. I wish to complain of my wife, Faith Black, that she keeps company with Judah Trumbull and John Howe. One night, she was seen walking with Judah Trumbull about the daylight settling in, with little space each of the other and being not seen from that time till midnight. She came about that time to Goody Wakeley's house. She came to the door and knocked at the door so soft, no one could hear her. Then she went the back side of the house and taken up a clapboard and knocking against the house, which wakened the woman who opened the door and let her in. She asked where she'd been that time of night and she answered she'd been at Goodman Clark's house eating fish. Goody Wakely asked me why she did not go home to her husband, and she answered that she did not care for going home. Likewise, several other times she was seen at John Howe's house and sometimes in bed with John Howe. I've been provoked several times to threaten her and tell her I would complain of her to the court, her father, and the rest of her friends. <laughs> Thank you, that was wonderful. And uh, I, you just have to imagine the Scottish accent. I actually just found out he was from Scotland earlier this evening. Um, so Daniel Black is complaining he goes to court because his wife is out of control. She's being seen with Judah Trouble and John Howe. Let me say this. One of the most interesting parts of the statement for me is that he says about daylight settling in, meaning when the sun is going down, she wasn't seen from sundown until midnight. And she says they were walking together with little space between them. So they're walking very closely together. And then at midnight, she realizes she's got to pretend that she was at Goody Wakeley's house all night, right? So remember those sleepovers that you have when you were a kid and you, you know, maybe weren't going to your friend's house and you had to sneak into your friend's house later. And so your, if your parents in the morning came to pick you up, you were there. That seems like that's what's happening here. She goes to her friend Goody Wakeley's house who says, where have you been? She says, I've been eating fish. I, there was a big fish party over at Goodman Clark's house. Um, and then she says, I also love how she's been seen walking closely with John Howe, but the fact that they were actually in bed together is not news. And that is actually because in part, people during this time often slept many people to a bed. Uh, it was one of the few ways that you could stay warm. There were very few beds often in these houses that, you know, and so the guests, if you had a guest in your house, you would often invite them to sleep in the bed with you. So. You know, thus it has ever been in Ipswich. Let's hear from Good Wife Black. I am Good Wife Black. My husband has called me bawd, swearing and cursing at me, threatening to kill me and knock my brains out. He told me to go and shift for myself and pulled off my stockings, turning me out of doors and not suffering me to come in so that I was forced to go in the snow to Goodman Carroll's, which was half a mile from my home. Thank you. Very poignant, Good Wife Black. So Good Wife Black's rejoinder to this accusation from her husband is that she has to leave the house because he's such a jerk. And he throws her out of the house with no stockings on and threatens to knock her brains out. So, you know, this was, she says, there's a, a more expanded witness statement here where she says he's a very jealous man and he accuses me at every turn. So uh, what we know from the court record, this, act, this case actually starts with the verdict. So I'll read you the verdict. Upon complaint made against Daniel Black and his wife, court ordered that they should sit one hour in the stocks. And for the, and for the future, said Black is not to threaten his wife or miscall her. In other words, call her names and to live peacefully with her. And she was to be orderly and not gad about. She was further ordered not to be in the company of John Howe or Judah Trumbull, nor come into the house of John Howe unless her husband sent her on business. And if either of them offend against the order, they were to be whipped. So the court found that both of them were responsible for their bad behavior and that she needed to calm down and he needed to calm down. And if they don't calm down, they're, they're gonna get whipped. So in the meantime, they get an hour in the stocks to work it out. All right, John Howe's not quite out of hot water yet. Let's call Samuel Purley. I am Samuel Purley. As John Howe and I were going to Topsfield, the latter took a paper out of his pocket and read to me verses concerning Goodwife Peabody, Goodwife Clark, 
and good wife Andras. These women were named in the first verse to this effect that they do together flock and so they spend their husband's stock and Master Woodcock shall be preacher to those three. That's awesome, thank you. So what you've just heard is a little dirty ditty that was written by John Howe, who seems to be a little bit of a boundary pusher. And this is one of those things that I love because these would never, ever, ever come up in any other record. Who's gonna write down a dirty poem that some guy told him on the way to Topsfield, right? So the poem is that these three women who are all wives of prominent leaders, um, <laughs> that they do together flock and spend their husband's stock and Master Woodcock shall be a preacher to these three. So we can all imagine the, understand the sexual implications there, which are the same as they would have been today. But again, nothing like this would ever have been saved except that it was brought up in the court. There are also a number of other things like toasts, songs uh, th that are written down, which would not have existed otherwise. So it's one of my favorite parts of the record. So thank you for beautifully reading a dirty poem. So certainly uh, there are uh, quite a few, you know, court records that are very much, you know, very much about, a lot of them are about drinking, a lot of them are about fornication. Um, and some of them are about those things, but also give a wonderful little insight into the way that people lived every day. So I'm going to leave us, I know we're running a little long on time, with John Darling of Malden. Mr. Darling, are you there? Hi, I'm John Darling of Malden. I found a great many in the house drinking. Some being full of drink, particularly Sergeant Eldridge of Malden, who had been there the greater part of the day before. Having occasion to be in the house all night, I say that Eldridge slept by the fire all night and if I had not been there, his clothes and perhaps himself would have been burned. So full of drink was the sergeant. In one room was one Muzzy and his wife. She sitting on one side of the table between two men and her husband on the other side of the table, merrily singing to the rest. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Camille. Thank you for being John Darling of Malden. Let me just say, I would really like to be sitting on one side of the table between two men and my husband on the other side singing to the rest. So I will, I will leave you with that image from the quarterly court records of a night where a bunch of drunk people are sitting around a table singing. And isn't that beautiful? It's a, a lovely little moment in ordinary people's lives that again, would never have been worthy of record otherwise. Um, so I hope that gave you just a little taste. Again, these are all from the 1664, from one seating of the Ips Ipswich session of the Essex County Quarterly Court. So every one of these has a million more, interspersed with a whole bunch of, you know, again, fights over fences and wills and inventories and things that I find fascinating, but you may not. Um, but I encourage you to, if you are interested, to go have a look. You can just Google Essex County Quarterly Court and read records for yourself. They're just wonderful. So if any of you have any questions uh, or if you would like any other information, uh, I obviously am enamored of all of these records and I hope every Tales and Ales that we do, we do different court records. So you can come every year, you can come to every session if you want and hear these wonderful voices from the past. So I hope you go to bed tonight and give a thought to all these people that were here being very human all those hundreds of years ago. Any questions for me? Hi, Greg. <laughs> it's my friend Greg I haven't seen in years. Uh, at this point, thank you, Bethany. That, that was just terrific. Um, I, I invite everybody to turn on their microphones and their videos if they feel comfortable to do so. Um, I don't see any questions. I just see nothing but delightful comments. I think everyone enjoyed themselves tonight at the first Friday. Um, I think... Uh, you're, you're absolutely right about the court records. I remember going into the Salem um, at the time, looking and exploring the records for the Salem witch trials because um, the, the Essex Institute was doing a exhibit in, um, I think it was 19, it would have been 1992, right? The tercentarial. Yeah. Yeah. And the court records at the time were in physically the building and to have that resource that that consistent, you know, Essex County records 
is so rich and you made them come alive. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. That was fun. That was great. Wonderful. Lots of fun. Thank great. You. Thank you, everyone. Oh, it's so good to see you all. <laughs> it was fun. Great show. Great job. I love it. Now, you all have to promise me that once the tavern's back open, you'll come to the actual tavern because it's so Absolutely. Absolutely. Jack, is there any other questions on YouTube? Yeah, you know, I was just checking. I didn't see anything on YouTube. There were about, I don't know, 50, 60 people there, but uh, no, nah, it looks like, uh, no, I didn't see any questions. Oh, can you comment about the use of beer on board sailing ships? The use of, of beer aboard yeah. sailing ships? Yeah. Where's, where's my James? Oh. Are you on here somewhere, Jimmy? Well, um, you want to talk about IPAs? Yeah, well, I, well that, was, that was a shipping thing. That was shipping beer from England to India. And uh, it didn't last very, it didn't, it didn't survive the trip very well. So they began adding more and more hops and it seemed to do a better job. And there was one point where they were actually fermenting on board ships. So to keep it fresh, because like tea, it was tasted. And if they didn't like the tea, they would reject it. So uh, getting beer to India in good shape was, was hard to do, but they succeeded. Um, uh, beer on ships, uh, it was mainly, depending what period, what time period, uh, mainly beer was, um, it was usually grog. Beer took up a lot of space. If you were gonna fill barrels of beer to give everybody uh, it would be a lot more. So what they came up with was the idea of using rum, rum, and then thinning out so not everybody gets uh, too hammered. So um, uh, it took up a lot less space on the ship, uh, but everybody deserved some grog for their hard work as well as, you know, so you got to have room for wa water as well, which is drinkable, but so is beer. But you know, I'm afraid there wasn't too much beer on ships. It was mainly, uh, mainly rum because of space. Mm-hmm. Isn't he isn't he nice to have around? <laughs> <laughs> Watch had a question though, Jack. I like being around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bob Watts is watching. Hi, Bob. He says, I always thought he was he's on YouTube. I always thought Sabbath day was filled with just church going. Did they start drinking at noon after the sermon? <laughs> well, that is not, I mean you weren't supposed to, you're, but you were allowed to go get a meal. So if you were from, you know, from what is now West Newberry and you had walked with your family for four miles to get to the meeting house, which, you know, happened, although again, it wasn't supposed to, you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to live within one mile of the meeting house, but many people did not. Um, and, you know, you needed to have a place to have lunch. So you, you brought your food with you or you could go to the tavern and have a, you know, fish and chips, but there are, there are enough uh, <laughs> fines in the record for drinking on the Sabbath that we all know it happened all the time. <laughs> Bethany, I have one last quick question about the singing in the beginning um, that uh, Jack incorporated. Tell us about the Porterman. Oh, Jimmy, tell us about the Porterman, would you? That, that was my Jimmy singing the sea shanty at the beginning. Oh. He's the man of many talents. <laughs> The heart and soul of the Porterman. What do you, what do you uh, say? <laughs> the Porterman, yes. We're just, you know, uh, uh, some friends and I, we got together and it was actually at a Tales of the Nails event. Um, Robert McEwen, one of the uh, the founders, I guess, if you will, was uh, showed up and was wenching, I think, that night, we call it. And uh, afterwards, we sat around, drank some cascales, singing, and was like, well, you yeah, know, we, we should really get together and and, and sing uh, some more stuff. So pretty soon the, the, the group, it was usually uh, uh, anywhere between seven to 10 men. We're now uh, nine. And uh, we started singing sea shanties before it was cool. <laughs> so anyway, we're still around. We have vinyl records over there at uh, Dino Records. We've got, uh, we're on every streaming uh, company, whether it's Apple, Spotify, whatever. So you can hear us. So uh, yeah, Jim, anyway. we at the custom house, we always think you're part of us, right? I mean, you've been at all our maritime days. Um, but I don't know, have you seen the movie, The Fisherman's Friends? 
Yes, yes, I've, I've seen Fisherman's Friend. We enjoyed that one, um, and I we we did a a bunch of events there for the Custom House where we were you know outdoors, even in pouring rain in that tent. But it sounded great. I mean, we just had so much fun. That was just like it was, and also that the ships that would come in. Sometimes you'd get a a, a ship in. Uh, and we were able to entertain people on board uh, for the custom house. I mean, Hopefully. yeah, and yeah. And, and we want to be there again whenever that happens, you know, <laughs> we can. Yeah, we want you there. <laughs> Thank you. They don't have a major record deal yet, but you can buy a Porterman record at Dyna Records. So <laughs> go for it. If you have a record player, go get one. I'm we are of- waiting. We are currently waiting for our fisherman's friend uh, moment. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a Jack Santos thing. <laughs> Go for it, yes. Jack. I love it. Well, I think um, everybody has stayed over the hour. I think it's an indication that this has been a real success. So thank you again. Well, um, thanks. thanks so much for having me. It's great. It was fun. Yeah, it was really fun. Thank you. Right. And can I can I say that uh oh, and Jim too. <laughs> Everybody, you know, everybody did a great job reading, every one of you. It, it, it doesn't always work out that at the uh, Tales and Ales, but um, tonight was stellar. You guys did great. I really well, Bethany told us not to practice, so that was <laughs> That's probably a, a big plus rather than, here, read this. You guys don't even think. Don't do anything, yeah. <laughs> but it was great. You guys all did really. I was just like blown away how, how well you all did. It's great. Well done. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Can't wait to, get to do it in person, Bethany. Oh, I can't wait to do uh, it. Too. That'll be fine. I'm going to have a look. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good night. Oh, good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.